All right, now it's on. Okay, so we'll try those introductions again. I'm Jim Eastman, a.k.a. Vitruvius, and I do music type production stuff, and this is Michael Waldstein, who also does music type production stuff. Uh, talking about today, production on, while well, being, you know, a cheap bastard, because we're cheap bastards. Uh, I'll be talking about DIY hardware and, you know, stuff you can build at home, and then I'll also be getting a little bit into communities that exist on the internet for trading loops, trading samples, getting some advice. Uh, cool little pictures of what you can do production-wise. And then Micah will be getting us into the world, wonderful world of Linux audio, all sorts of Linux audio applications that exist. Which is really a misnomer. There I go talking already. It's really free and open source audio because it, all the stuff that's going runs under OSX. True that, true that. Thank you very much. <laughs> so that's the agenda, I guess, for the presentation. Um, for the wonderful world of DIY hardware, before I can get anywhere, you've got to know how to solder. Uh, so if you're going to be building your own analog synths or your own compressors or your own amplifiers at home, helps to be handy with a solder iron. So this wonderful website called MediaCollege.com has some cool little tutorials. They have a lot of audio tutorials, a lot of video tutorials, but they also have a very nice how to solder tutorial. Uh, I'm not going to give you a how to solder tutorial because whatever. Um, but, you know, go out there, go to Radio Shack, drop 20 bucks on a cheap, like, 15-watt solder iron, and go to town. Have fun, practice, get good at soldering, because when you want to build analog synths, you got to solder. Uh, while we're on the tutorials section, we we'll go over to the audio tutorials page of the Media College website here. A lot of basics on just how to get started in audio in general. If you want to do production but have no idea how audio works, have no idea how the technology works, this is really a great place to get started. And this isn't the only source of it. You can, you know, take advantage of the wonderful Googleness of the internet and search around for fun audio tutorials. But I like the Media College website. I think it's really well put together. Covers most of the basic topics. There's also a number of blogs out there that cover sort of the audio education side of things. One of my favorites being the Audio Mastermind blog. Uh, in this case, it's a particular post about a set of tutorials for mastering, EQing, everything you want to get into in production. If I'm throwing terms out that confuses people, let me know and I'll adjust as needed. Uh, I have a tendency to kind of get lost in the world of audio speak. Uh, so if, if if a, world like, if a word like, you know, audio compression doesn't mean anything to you, let me know and I'll try to explain a little better. But until then, I'm just going to keep rolling until anybody has anything. Oh, and apparently we have tickets to give away, so if you ask, like, cool, insightful, interesting, or even boring, dull, and out there questions, we'll give you some tickets to enter for a raffle type stuff. So, Audio Mastermind, one of many excellent blogs on the subject of audio technology, music technology. Uh, these guys post regular tutorials for any number of subjects. I think there was one recently about how to mic a drum set, which is actually surprisingly complicated. And that takes me over to the next page. There is a recording wiki. It's wikirecording.org. Uh, it's pretty young still. It's been around for a few months now. But like any wiki, it's slowly growing a collection of tips, tricks, tutorials, all sorts of other fun stuff focused exclusively on the world of recording, and included in that also some production stuff. Just general guides about technology. Pretty much all over the place. You get in, I don't know how easy this is to read. But you get into a lot of, there's a lot of microphone technique on, the, on this wiki I found. So if you really want to get into recording stuff for your production, this is a great place to go, uh, in addition to any of a number of the other sites I've located for you. Tasty coffee upstairs. Anyways, so these are some great places to get started into the, into the technology of music in general. Uh, there's some music theory tutorials as well that I don't have open at the moment, but it's really good to know this stuff before actually getting into, into production. I'm always, always, always amazed at how many producers there are out there who don't know what a chord is. And so I really think the audio basics, the music basics, Everything in that world is really important before you actually get into audio production. Now the fun stuff. This is a class down 
at the uh, at Georgia Tech, professor there is offering an elective on analog synthesizers. Uh, the cool part about this, all his lectures are posted video files online. So you can download them and learn about, you know, voltage controlled oscillators and transconductance amplifiers and all the wonderful analog circuitry of all those old school synthesizers that everyone loves now and sells for thousands of dollars on eBay. You know, the Moogs, the, uh, the old school Yamahas, things like that, you know. So this, is, this really gets into the wonderful world of analog synths. Uh, gets into the theory, but this is one of those things where it really helps to have a, a bit of a background in electrical engineering. Uh, if you don't know what an operational amplifier is, you probably don't want to start here. Because this is, this is a high-level engineering class. I think it's great, but I have a background in double E, so I have the conceptual basis. If you have a background in double E, I really recommend this, though. It is an excellent way to learn about music synthesis. Uh, on a more basic level, there's a lot of other DIY projects that sort of exist already that just require the knowledge of soldering, as I mentioned before. There's a lot of, there's this eMusic DIY ar archive from Andrews, um, and a lot of this stuff is stuff you can find by Googling for DIY music or DIY synth, uh, things like that, but it gets into the basics of a lot of what you want to build without necessarily getting to the theory of it. Looks like a complicated circuit, but if you're just soldering it together, you really don't care about how the transistor works, do you? So, great way to get started there. Uh, there's this particular archive. There's edrum.free.fr, which is for all the uh, synthesized drum heads in the room. Little drum kits, little... Uh, you know, pulse to MIDI converter boxes, all sorts of fun stuff, you know, little things you can build to put up in a drum kit, you know, wire up a symbol so that it'll act as a MIDI controller as well as an, an actual symbol. A lot of cool little projects here. The detail on this particular page is a bit lacking, but there is some good stuff here. There's the wonderful world of synth DIY and, of course, what community would be complete without a mailing list. So there is the Synth DIY mailing list. Uh, and these guys, a little wacky at times, but you know, what mailing list isn't. But these are great guys to talk to if you really want to get into building your own synths. Uh, do your own hardware synthesis in general. I love hardware synthesis. I think it's great. Although most of the stuff I do is digital just because it's cheaper. Um, if you're actually buying gear, digital synths are cheaper. If you're building gear, it's about the same, and analog synths are more fun. But that's just my opinion. And there is, of course, also synthdiy.com, which is a, a pretty, uh, not huge community, but growing community about building your own synths at home. Now, if you don't want to build your own stuff, there's a lot of other ways to get gear out there. There's the usual cheapy methods, uh, eBay great place to get old used synth gear, old audio gear. Uh, hang out in local communities. There's a lot of people who get into production for a while, get out of production, and then just offload all their gear. So you can have somebody who was into production for a few years, maybe is moving, maybe is doing something else, and just getting rid of the entire rack of gear. You can get some good synths that way. I picked up some good gear that way. I like that way. It's a good way to go. Used gear. Especially the quality stuff, because it doesn't really break down a whole lot. So that's the wonderful world of DIY hardware. Um, I don't think I have too much else on that. Any questions at this point? All right. Well, I have, I have a few communities to talk about. You know, I have a few more minutes. Yeah. Um, well, I guess you can, you can look at it this way. There are a number of companies that sell synth kits out there that you can build. Uh, in the analog world, a synth kit will probably run you a couple thousand dollars, but, you know, say a brand spanking new uh, Alesis 
analog synthesizer is going to be no less than four or five thousand dollars. So I mean, depending on the scale, it, but it, I could say building your own is probably no more than fifty percent of the cost of buying it as is. I actually have a couple of hardware related comments. Um, any Good call. Okay, cool. There's ridiculous cool things you can do with a pretty chip, um, the and audio. For instance, if you want to build your own like thousand type device, there's a app that um yeah that controllers <laughs> based on around uh, um but if you start digging further you can also use um very six as a device to uh, push phone effects low level or but, um which is ridiculous hardcore but if you really want a a cool way to play around kind of very similarly you can do a lot of stuff with digitally controlled analog synthesizers so that you know your sound source is still all analog it's still all analog processing but instead of using analog control information uh, you can do it through a digital controller it opens up a lot of worlds a lot of the new analog synths being sold commercially today are digitally controlled analog synths as opposed to for example the original Moog type devices which were uh, all analog controlled analog synths and actually I realized that I might Scaring people away, but if you're really interested in building your own controller type device, and what have you, don't actually know how to program PIC2, because I, Lord, I don't know. But um, you can buy chips already flashed with the uh, whatever you need to, in order to build a complete MIDI controller that, you know, takes a lot, translates it over into something. Cool. Another uh, sort of sister site app. Info, I believe, which a, is a site dedicated to building sort of head box that finds e drum applications. And all that they do is take, you know, what happens in between when you hit the, a drum and get the pitch. Some little box or cute little potentiometers so that you can just like. And it's also built around, uh, you know, how to build your own trigger hat for it. You build symbols out of Tupperware or symbols out of Tupperware fairly regularly, and um, I'm not a professional, so I don't know exactly <laughs> how useful all this is from a practical standpoint. As a percussionist, I can say that it is very useful. I I haven't used the site that you particularly mentioned, but this eDrum for free site covers a lot of the same trigger to MIDI converters as well. Um, <laughs> the, the other the other thing that you can do is if you already have drum that don't make a leap to, you know, building all of your own ads, buying all of your own ads, and put particular little kids inside of all of them or mic in order to drive a head box to pump out MIDI signal and do whatever the heck you MIDI's really cool. Another really important place to start playing around with particular hardware. Um, so yeah, MIDI's basically uh, the be-all, end-all of, of on digital audio controls. Basically everything works on MIDI these days. I have a few more things. Hang on a sec. You're always so pushy. Um, I just wanted to take a few minutes and let you know about, I guess, the number of communities that exist on the internet for advice, for trading loops, samples, tracks in general. Uh, for those of you who are local, one of those forums I hang out on quite a bit is clevelandnightlife.net and there's a producer's forum for people who produce music. A uh, great way to get feedback on tracks that you've been working on, great way to trade samples, trade loops, etc. A number of local communities exist out there. I'm sure you can find one for any local community, really. There's the uh, futureproducers.com website, which uh, has some articles, has some forums. They could use some help with their web design, but the content's actually pretty good. Um, and again, it's just it's a way of getting a lot of information, trading experiences with a lot of other people. And then one of my other favorite forums on here is something called the Freesound Project, which is essentially a loop and sample 
trading community. Everything posted on here is under a Creative Commons sample license. So all you have to do is attribute the author, and you can use all sorts of fun samples on here. I've gotten some great road samples on here, uh, all sorts of electronic piano samples on here, a lot of old school analog sounds that are hard to find these days. There's something like 16,000 samples and loops on the Freesound project right now. So great for that. There's also, of course, then a forum on here for trading advice, trading tips and tricks and things like that. Um, but yeah, communities, there's a lot of support out there, basically. There's a lot of people who can help you out, a lot of people who can give specific advice, answer specific questions for you. All you got to do is find it. And now you can do your own thing. So I didn't get to start this talk. Anyone use Linux or purely free software to do it? You know what, it doesn't have to be purely free software. I guess the DSPs can flip in there, here or there. So if you know anything about pro professional Linux audio, this is going to be absolutely worthless for you. Because let me give you sort of the, the combination introduction, disclaimer, and what I'm hoping that all of you will get out of this talk. So I don't really consider myself to be a musician at any level. Uh, I use audio tools more from a performance type of standpoint. Um, I should be starting my computer. More from a performance type standpoint. So a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be showing you, I don't really necessarily know how to make do anything particularly practical. Yeah. My goal is to give you guys some good Googleable keywords so that you know you aren't starting completely from scratch and things like Jack and Ladspa don't don't just sort of scare you and you know we start running in circles which is really easy to do because there are very few comprehensive um, tutorials on how the professional Linux production audio environment is put together and because I don't do this very often I never figured out how to make my computer start the external DAC without restarting so it'll take a second. Sorry. Um, so I mentioned my background was more in a performance side of things. Um, the core, hmm, something that Jim didn't mention, I think, which is a, sort of a necessary prerequisite wait, the requisite to what I'm going to be talking about, is that running out and buying lots of expensive hardware, while it gives you lots of shiny toys, and there's sort of this instant feedback to bright and shiny toys, will no way make you a good performer or a good musician. You will just have sunk many thousands of dollars into hardware. I'd say that if you're serious or even if you're only moderately interested, a great, the minimum that you probably need is a um, keyboard controller. And they can be really cheap. There's one sitting in the back of the room that's, I believe, an M-Audio that probably ran in, whatever, in the neighborhood of $120. Um, learning to play piano is not necessarily, it's probably a worthwhile use of your time if you're interested in doing audio production at, you know, anything more than clipping together samples. Um, I'm going to add, you don't necessarily get very good at learning piano. This a basic knowledge of work You don't have to perform a little, a little, a little basic here is the keyboard. Yeah, it's working. Um, so a basic, you know, keyboard type controller will get you pretty far um, on the route that you want to go. The after that, pretty much anything that you might want to be able to do in ha in hardware, you can do in software. Though it might be a little more difficult. The other caveat that I need to give you guys about sort of the world of Linux audio right off the bat is that you're going to have to be concerned and I'll, I'll, again, give my uh, preface on that it's not really Linux audio, is that latency is the biggest issue that anyone has to worry about. And because of sort of the whole nature of the beast, it's up to you to worry about latency instead of the operating system sort of magically coding over it until things break in a really bad way. So if you start reading around the Linux audio forums, people say not very nice things to uh, folks who run, for instance, the 2.6 kernel. Because 
because its real-time type scheduling stuff isn't really up to Linux audio production standards, although I honestly haven't had any problems. But then, as I said, I do things more from a performance standpoint rather than a let's see how many filters we can put on this to break our machine standpoint. So I sort of have made these two caveats that when I say Linux audio production, I really mean sort of free audio production. At the core of the Linux professional production, blah, 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 is this low latency audio server called Jack. So it, who, how many people in here have gotten at least far enough to you know, play an MP3 under Linux? Most of you? Oh, goodness. Um, so there are two low-level audio drivers in the Linux kernel currently, one of which is going away, one of which is, is nice and pretty, which are OSS and ALSA. OSS is, is worth forgetting, except that I assume it's easier to program for, which is why people still keep writing interface support. ALSA is the other one. It has support for more hardware these days. Hardware support is going to come back to bite us in a little moment. On top of that, people write ridiculous numbers of demons to make it so that you can play audio from more, multiple sources at the same time, simplifications to the API, such as like port audio, so you only need to write software for port audio instead of writing for both OSS and also, and I assume it goes to other places as well. Um, ESD, art, things like that, which you may or may not be familiar with, and which is why sound under GNOME and sound under KDE work differently. Thank you for making it worse. Um, all work differently. They're, the direction people are going in sort of is, is two ways. There's GStreamer for desktop users, and then there's Jack for more professional users. Jack sits on top of this ridiculous high stack and can run either through OSS or ALSA, or if you're under OSX, it can run through Core Audio without any problem. The reason this is great, I forgot, was forgetting to take a breath there, sorry. Um, the reason that this is generally fantastic is that when you're running on OSX on top of Core Audio, you no longer have to worry about things like, oh, Linux doesn't really have any drivers for a, any Firewire audio interfaces, which if you already own something or come from a Mac world, you probably have a FireWire interface. Fortunately, USB 2.0 interfaces are, for the most part, pretty well supported, and they work almost the same. Um, I can get into a rant about why FireWire isn't supported in general, and it has to do with things that I really don't understand, but we'll talk about at length anyway. Um, so. There's two pieces of hardware. I, I've talked already about one piece of hardware that you might want to get, which is a keyboard controller. If you're doing a different type of production, though, the other thing that you want, might want to invest in is a, I want lots of signals coming in. I want lots of signals coming out uh, so I can you know, record a band, which very easily gets up to you know, 10 inputs when you have five on the drum set. So. Pay attention, if particularly if you're considering working in a free software environment, to take a look at what's supported before you take the plunge to spend you know, $800 on an I.O. box. Um, support keeps getting better, but it's far, far from perfect. Um, the good thing is that most entry-level interfaces are all supported. So the absolutely atrocious built-in sound card on my laptop works just fine, and this presentation is going to be really interesting because I'm going to do fun things like try to mic the crappy speakers on my laptop so that you can hear awful sound. By the way, are there any, is anyone here who's lived in Australia at a, for any point of time, period of time? No? OK, good. So you won't be reminded of childhood inadequacies. Get to it in a moment. <coughs> so I talked a little bit about Jack, which is the wonderful um, end-all, be-all of sort of low latency sound in the open source environment. All that Jack does is it says, is it's like a patch bay in the physical world, except in a low latency way. So in a low latency type of environment, which I'm going to stop saying from now on, it patches together programs. Um, programs generally just get connected straight to your output. But Jack lets, gives you the opportunity to do things like patch together oh, lots and lots of programs, which I'll try to demonstrate in a little bit, and also patch together lots and lots of different filters. I'm avoiding the light. Because 
no one should see mine. Um, the, uh, let me quickly get Jack started here. Um, this is just two Jack control um, that, that runs in its own pretty, pretty way. But, oh. this, is, this is what pops up when you get Jack all, all happily configured, is that there are inputs on one side, outputs on the other side. Right now, I'm running it through an also driver, so we have inputs and outputs from all stuff. And it's also, by the way, a dirty, dirty lie, because the, all the inputs on the, this con computer are mono, but it takes it as stereo. But we'll ignore that for the time being. So let's make something play, just to get us started. Um, and the easiest thing is always running a drum machine, because it'll loop forever, and, well, it doesn't get that annoying that quickly. Can you tell I'm used to a much, much bigger window? Desktop? Oh, that's right. You can't hear anything. <laughs> OK, so this is going to be the really interesting part where, where I'm going to do things and claim that sound is coming out, and you're all just going to have to believe me until I unmute things. So when I ran Hydrogen, what it did is it said, I'm going to be using the, the jack output driver, so take it away. And it opened up two output two outputs and it automatically connected it to okay the input inside of jack which is ends up throwing out music inputs outputs i just sort of start randomly babbling and they they become the same thing sooner or later okay fortunately jim didn't take much time and this is taking me much longer than i expected uh, um i'm just unmuting things because i was testing earlier okay so Oh, that's not going to work at all. I realized I actually did something without telling you guys about it. Um, so this is QJack control again. And I hit play here, but the setup that was inside of Hydrogen, which is our drum machine of choice for today, also started playing. One of the things about Jack that you'll quickly notice, particularly if you're coming from a more professional audio background, is that everything's its own program. So suddenly you have to synchronize up all of these programs that are more or less independent. In the hardware world, you do this all via MIDI and, and send MIDI machine controls and say, ready, go, at the appropriate times, and things would go or not go if things are broken. So in the Jack world, there is a master transport that will synchronize up everything that cares to synchronize up, um, which unfortunately isn't quite everything you'd ever want. So in certain circumstances, you're still stuck with not doing everything you'd ever want. Um, but let's add a couple more. Are there questions, comments? People can interrupt me. I don't mind. Tangents are fine. And you know, if you get me too far off, I'll just start talking about how I like to shave with razors from the 40s, and then it'll be all be over. But, oh, let's, let's take a look at what you might be more used to, quote unquote, in, in some other type of world, which is kind of a do-it-all program, which I'm using Rose Garden, and hopefully it starts. We're just going to pretend that it is while I keep talking. Rose Garden is kind of like Cakewalk in many ways. Mo many, many tracks, you can you get a pretty, pretty um, editors, and on the way there, you get to, uh, uh, remember how I talked about latency and timer resolution? I don't have a high, high, high resolution timer install set up right now. Oh, God, this sucks. <clears throat> We're just going to pretend that we can see everything. So, let's just start playing with things and okay so now we have rose garden talking to hydrogen because rose garden itself actually doesn't do any sound production unless you're dealing with wave files that you can or audio general audio files that you can dump onto you know one of your sequences or whatever what have you and then if we go back, we'll notice, oh, look, we have Rose Garden outputs that have autom automatically connected to their inputs. 
Another thing that you might notice is that Rose Garden has more or less automatically connected itself to the input. So you have an audio recording device now, too. But this is sort of a really sim simple way, right? We have kind of input to recorder to output, basically, right now, or controller to generator to output, which is at the simplest level what you'll be doing almost all the time. But in a sort of physical hardware world, what you're going to be doing is catching things through ridiculous numbers of filters, for instance. So let me start up some random filters and, and show you what all of that does. Uh, where did I bury this? Yeah. So one of the cool things about running Linux on the uh, on an 86 platform is that I you can run Wine on it, and since you can run Wine, you can run things like VST for filters. And the great thing about running VST filters is it just sets itself up like another node in what was in our whole massive Jack fun goodness. And actually, there Jack is just a daemon or command line process that you can interact with in any number of ways. So another. This is another way of looking at the same thing, which is ridiculously crazy. And I'm going to have to drag these around a little more. And that's output, so we've got lots of things going in. This is all small. OK, so here we, what we can do is we can say, well, OK, let's, you know what, in, let's attach the outputs from hydrogen and run it through transverb. and. Oh, I don't know. Oh, we need to disconnect all first. My bad. So now we have our, and if you notice, we've also got MIDI connections set up here as well. So we've got Rose Garden, our sequencing master at the moment, running into our hydrogen MIDI in, which is generating audio that's running through a VST server that I'm running through Windows emulation that then goes to the output. And and everything, most of the time, works like a charm. If, if you hear like a low level of, I may be lying under all of this, it's kind of true. OK, good. Sound comes out. So it's running through our VST program all happily. Now, what do I want to look at now? Oh, there's so many things. So this is sort of the basic starting building block. And it just kind of snowballs from here. Oh man, I'm sorry. <laughs> cool. Why don't you take that, Jim? On a basic level, it allows plugins, filters, also the whole world of professional. You might have taken him? <laughs> I'm going to call you now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, that's my basic V so let me VSTs, I, I honestly have absolutely no clue what you said. There are a couple of different types of VSTs. You can you run filters, which is what I'm running right now. You can also run uh, sound generators thing, um, or synthesizers or you know. Uh, 303 emulators or whatever ridiculous type of it's a it's a wide wide world and there are plenty free for you to go out and play with. Um, 
the so this actually leads in very well to another good story that I've got. Um, so VST was very much Windows world, and there's kind of an equivalent for Mac that I don't know because I'm not a Mac user. Um, but there is kind of a Linux equivalent, which are Latspa filters. I have absolutely no clue what it stands for, and it's only barely pronounceable. But what they are is they're a very generic fil uh, filter interface that, and really it's more like a generic let's do audio interface, where all the, the filter does, or the, the SO does, is it says, so I have these inputs, I want this type of data on these inputs, and I have these outputs, and I want this type of data on these outputs. And that's it. VSTs, if you notice, here have this whole like big rich graphical thing attached to them as well. Um, the new pretty Linux equivalent to that are DSSIs, which uh, uh, yes, they're DSSIs, that, which is also completely unmarketable. Um, so the cool thing about the cool thing about um, LASPA filters is that you can build up your own modular synth from them because people have written filters to emulate pretty much every part of modular descent that you'd ever want. And I'm going to do this through this lovely program called Ohm, which looks actually identical to this type of thing. But instead of just connecting things together, I can also sort of drag and drop things together and make, make the magic happen. So we're going to build a really simple and really irritating uh, synth. And, um, then, then we'll make good things happen. How much am I cropping off? Okay. So, that's not what I wanted. So, this all, the whole thing starts with adding an output node, which, as soon as we run it, should create yep, thing, a, uh, a output node in for Jack, and let's just sort of keep adding plugins. And we're not going to add too many. I'm only going to get the three, I think, and that should be enough to make a oh ridiculously annoying sound. So what I just had was I added a sine oscillator with audio in controlled inputs, and two more, which just turned into three, but we'll hide that and pretend it doesn't exist. Two more with uh, control level input. That I'm now going to hook up in a obnoxiously annoying way. That now does really irritating things that, can everyone hear this? Good, it's stopping. Now there are also high pass, low pass filters, any type of delay that you'd ever want. Um, Barry Satan Maximizer is the last of filter that just absolutely destroys the signal but makes it ridiculously loud in really annoying ways. Um, and on and on. If you didn't notice, there's a really, really long list of plugins that existed to uh, that list of let's load patches that I, that I popped up before. Right. So, that's not me, is it? No. Good. That's someone else breaking things. Excellent. There, one of the cool things about Jack is it's relatively easy to program. And so there are things like, I'm not going to demonstrate all of them, but if you want to experiment in, I think that this crazy function will make some crazy noise. Let me see what it does. Um, for instance, the, the, it, there are you know, modules for many, many types of programming languages to do anything that you'd vaguely ever want to. For instance, the oddest one that I ran across recently was a, um, oh, goodness gracious, what's, what's the core term for it? It was evolutionary? I don't know. Anyhow, it was, it's a synthesizer, it was a one-button synthesizer written in Python where it randomly made four different synthesizers you clicked on one, and it makes a sound, and makes three more slightly mutated versions of that. And you just keep clicking around until you get the sound that you want. Unfortunately, this is completely apractical, as the only sound it seemed to be able to do was boo, and various like crackly versions of boo. 
but someone people start it's a great environment to play around with and muck around with in a in a very very deep deep and meaningful way let me you know, i realize that i've gotten this far without kind of mentioning two of sort of the the big names in linux audio production which are ardor and um jamming well jamming's kind of neither here nor there ardor though is is sort of the backbone for a lot of Linux audio production. It's a multi-channel hard disk recorder, and that's all that it does. It has many, many channels, and you can record on all the channels, or record on one of the channels, and preview on the other channels, and it's integrally tied into Jack in a way so that it can be a master Jack controller. It can automatically do things like, um, if you're familiar with hardware mixers, do inserts on channels. So automatically load a LASPA filter, loop it out, and coming back, um, and, and what have you. All of the really good tutorials that exist, and I don't really have any pointers for you today, but um, are based around Ardor. So A-R-D-O-U-R, -A check it out. Um, if you're looking for something not quite so serious, though, um, Audacity is a great multi-track recorder that lots and lots of people use, and it's multi-platform, except it doesn't use Jack at all. So I haven't mentioned it. So there. Um, Ardor can be a bit daunting because it's ridiculously massive and it, it kind of follows the, you know what, since we're, we're writing a, a new program on not Windows, let's, let's do our own interface. And uh, it takes a little bit of getting used to. It's definitely a, a pro-level app in the sense that it's not the type of thing you can just kind of drop in and get started. For that, I'd recommend something like Rose Garden, which was our pretty let's control hydrogen program, and you can also do wave record. Something that you may be asking yourselves, and hopefully you all are, is, well, gosh darn, what happens if I want to turn off my computer go to and go to sleep at some point in time, or, I don't know, do something else with my life, since um, Jack is blocking, since it's low latency, it doesn't really like letting other programs access sound, and it runs at ridiculously low priorities, and you, you lose. So there's a project that I know absolutely nothing about, but I'm going to talk about anyway, called, that was originally, um, oh, I believe LADCA. It's now Lash for Linux Audio Session Handler, I believe. And what it does is it's a way to tell all of the programs that you have, I want to save all of your settings, and I want you to record all of the ways in which these cute things are connected together, as in here, which I could really probably organize a little better at this point. Um, and I, I've lost my train of thought completely. So anyhow, last is another good keyword. Check it out. It used to be Ladka, so that name gets brandied around a whole heck of a lot. Again, you run into the difficulty where not every program you might ever want to use implements it in every single way that you'd ever want. Um, but the biggies all do. Um, so things like Ardor have no problems with it. Hydrogen has no problem. Um, Jackrack, which I haven't even, which I haven't shown you. Um, let me actually sort of, before I, well, ask, I'll ask questions in just a second, but a really good place to check out for um, additional information if you just want a huge link dump is linux-sound.org. That's one you might want to write down, linux-sound.org, which is um, a big name in the Linux audio community, has keep track of basically everything that ever goes on anywhere, and you get a lot of, there are a lot of, uh, people write a lot of synthesizers. There are a lot of very cool synthesizers. Are there any questions, since people are waving at me a lot? Yes. OK. Um, Linux Audio Dev and Linux Audio Users. I have absolutely no clue what the websites are, because they're very obscure. Um, they are, but the link to them are not, or the archives to them are not. Um, so search for Linux Audio Developer and Linux Audio Server. They're often abbreviated LAU and LAD. Hmm. 
Hmm? Oh, I, I mean, it depends on what exactly you're trying to do. Those are definitely good starting points, and it's kind of where I just lurk, and it's the good best place to collect new developments, and this is all changing very, very rapidly. Um, so those are the two good places to start. If you're interested in, you know, more direct, how do I, coding for Jack, there's the Jack developers list um, is probably a good place to hang out. Um, the also developers list is also very active at streaming about how X and such and such um, hardware company has once again refused any assistance and so on and so forth. I'm going to be hanging around for about the next hour somewhere around. So if anyone wants to come and play with things on a resolution that is not crap, um, we can, we can, I, I have no problem. My trackball is, is dying on me though. Yeah. <laughs> it, I have absolutely no idea because I have, I, I think the number is very small is my honest impression. Um, Basically, as soon as you want to start start doing things in hardware, if you can afford hardware, you can afford Pro Tools, and it becomes kind of a mute issue unless you're you're religiously dedicated to open source. Um, one last thing that I, I should probably mention, and I was meaning to bring CDs, but then I forgot, well, um, is that there is there are a couple of bootable CDs that you can drop into your computer that give you full Jack environments along with at least the major tools. Um, it's called Angula, the Moody, or something ridiculous like that. Okay. Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> Damn Europeans. <laughs> oh, cool. Ohm's very new, it is very, very new, but, or it's new enough that people are ignoring it, with good reason, probably. <laughs>